Sounds like it's working. All right, uh, fantastic. Hi folks, uh, my name is Sam Trail. Um, I am a graduate student. Oh, I just have to hit, got it, one second. <laughs> There we go. All right. Um, so today I'll I have the pleasure of talking with you guys about from beach to the sea, what we know about tiny turtles. Uh, so thank you so much for the invite. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'll talk for some time, but also we'll have plenty of time for questions as well. Um, so if you guys at any point can't hear me, just let me know. Um, Tammy's monitoring the Zoom and I'll be sure to speak up. Uh, all right. Should we get started? Yeah. Let me to. There we go. Oops. <laughs> We're skipping ahead. All right. Now we now we've got it. Uh, so as I said, my name is Sam Trail. Uh, I am a PhD student at Florida Atlantic University in the Integrated Biology Department. Uh, so that means that I study living things, which is pretty cool. Um, and as you can see here, uh, I study tiny turtles, like this one in my hand um, on the screen. So just a little bit about my journey and how I got here. Uh, this is me when I was really young at uh, Loggerhead Marine Life Center, if you've ever been up to Juneau Beach. Um, this was my very first research paper in fourth grade called Sea Turtles, uh, Why Are They Endangered and How Can We Help? So um, I went from here to what I'm doing now, right? At the, at the ripe old age of 31. Uh, so you might guess that if I'm doing this now, it's been a pretty direct path, uh, but in fact, it looked a lot more like this. Uh, so before uh, making my way to grad school at Florida Atlantic, um, I went to the College of William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. I majored in biology and education. I really looked up to my teachers and coaches growing up, and I was like, huh, I should be just like them. Um, so I taught for four years out in Colorado Springs. Uh, loved science, loved that my students were engaged in learning new things every day. And I was like, that sounds like a pretty cool job. Uh, so from that point, I started a master's program in teaching for biological sciences. I got to do this program at the Denver Zoo, which is a pretty unique experience as well. Uh, so I got to study these white-cheeked gibbons and how they interact with each other. Uh, one of the fun facts, they used to swing over the guests and they learned that if they uh, feed over, over them, they would get a big reaction and they loved that. Um, so that was always kind of funny. Um, so I, I can say that I got my master's at the zoo, which very few people can say. Uh, and from that, I was like, yes, I love the teaching part, um, but I also really love the research part. And then a light bulb went off and I was like, there's a job where I can do both. Uh, so then I started getting some research experience. I worked up at Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, which is in Crested Butte, Colorado, uh, wildflower pollinator capital of the world, um, studying aphids. So if you take a look at this picture right here, this is the largest sea turtle on the planet that weighs about 2,000 pounds. And I started my uh, biology journal journey studying some of the tiniest insects that there are. Um, on this plant here in collaboration with some folks at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Uh, and then from there, I decided I needed a little bit more uh, experience in the aquatic realm, getting my feet wet, literally and figuratively. Uh, so then I worked at Ohio State's Aquatic Ecology Lab studying something even smaller. I studied algae and how that related to harmful algal blooms in the Great Lakes. Uh, and then I finally got to sea turtles. So it's been a winding path. Uh, so those of you out there, if you're interested in turtles and you're like, ah, oh, it's just a hobby or something like that, um, there's a path there. Yes, I can do that. I can do that. I will slow down. I apologize. <laughs> so uh, at Florida Atlantic University, I study sea turtle movement. So some of the questions that I ask, why do turtles move? And how do they move? So for my master's, I did my master's work at Florida Atlantic as well. I looked at uh, their sensory biology. So how what they can see impacts how they get from land to the water. Sea turtles crawl towards the lowest and brightest horizon. Um, so really they're just looking for that light reflecting off the water and that's how they get to the ocean. And I looked at that in leatherback sea turtles. 
And now for my PhD, I'm getting literally into the water and looking more at the biomechanics. So that exact idea of how exactly they're swimming and how that changes from the time they're tiny, tiny hatchlings to slightly larger uh, turtles about the size of your hand. And we'll get to why that life stage pr is pretty important later. Uh, so that's kind of the stuff that I'm interested in. Um, but I am housed at the FAU Marine Lab. So this is a working marine laboratory that's free and open to the public. So if anyone has ever been to Gumbo Limbo Environmental Complex, you've probably seen this exact view, right? So we are housed in the same place as the Nature Center. Uh, the city owns some of it. Gumbo Limbo Coastal, Coastal Stewards owns some of it. Uh, and we have our kind of satellite campus there as well. So during the height of nesting season, you might see between 200 and 300 tiny turtles from our visitors gallery where you can see this exact view. So today I'll focus a little bit on what we've been doing at the lab for the last about 20 years. Um, so I can answer those questions, but also if you have some questions about what I just covered in my own research, I'm happy to answer those things as well. So sound good? Yeah? yeah. All right. Fantastic. So if I'm going to talk about sea turtles, let's get our foundation here. There are seven species of sea turtles uh, across the globe. So it's really easy if you want to study something, great, pick something where there's only seven and then you can memorize them really quickly, right? Uh, so here are all their names. We do have Archelon here, which is an extinct species that was really, really large, but just putting into perspective how big these things are. Um, and here in South Florida, we have three species that regularly nest on our beaches. And that's from March 1st, so we're in nesting season, through the end of October. So we get the most loggerhead nests, followed by greens, and then we also get leatherbacks as well, although not as many. So if you ever see a, a nest here in, in South Florida, it's probably one of these three species, and I'll tell you what those look like on the beaches. But when we have them in the lab, oh, just kidding. We'll talk about nesting right now. Uh, so when they come onto the beach to nest, uh, they crawl up at night. They'll pick a perfect spot in the sand, right? Mom will dig a, a body, a body pit. And then she'll start depositing her eggs. So this was the front view. That's after she's dug a hole and thrown a lot of sand over, over her body and everywhere else. And then she starts depositing eggs. So this is the back view. So pretty amazing, they dig that hole. Imagine digging a perfect cylinder with your feet and not even looking at it. That's basically what these turtles are doing. And they're digging that hole about three to four feet down. Um, and she'll deposit, this is a loggerhead turtle. She'll deposit between 80 and 120 eggs. Uh, depending on the species, bigger turtles, bigger eggs, so fewer in the egg chamber. Um, but that's a pretty, a pretty rough estimate of all the species that we'll get here, somewhere between 80 and 120. And then she covers them back up, camouflages it real well, and crawls back into the water and says, good luck, little turtles, right? So she leaves those, those eggs on the beach. And then about 45 to 80 days later, depending on the species, uh, also depending on the temperature, right? If you're cooking an egg for breakfast and you're in a hurry, crank it up, right? Same thing with turtles. Uh, the faster it is, or the hotter it is, the faster they will develop. The cooler it is, the slower they'll develop. Uh, so in about 45 to 80 days, quite a range, you'll get little hatchlings that are ready to head to the ocean themselves. These are little leatherback hatchling noses. So they'll all emerge together, come out of there, hopefully make it to the water. So just a little bit about their life cycle. We have those hatchlings. And they become what are called post hatchlings. And we'll talk about this is a lot of the size that we'll see at the marine lab. And this is a really interesting life stage because we don't know where they spend their time. Or for a long time, we didn't, right? We saw them when they were this big on the beach. We saw them when they came back on the beach about this big. And then we said, well, I guess they're surviving, but we don't know where they're going. Um, so this is a pretty mysterious life stage. And we'll talk about what we're doing at the marine lab to figure some of those things out. From then they become juveniles. So they went out into the open ocean and then as juveniles, most species will start coming into closer waters, more coastal waters, now that they're big enough to not get eaten by all those predatory fish that are close there. Then they'll come back 
to their natal region or about the same area where they were laid as hatchlings or as eggs, uh, and they will mate themselves. Mom will lay her nest on the beach. And then she'll do that a few times, usually skipping a few years in between. So she might deposit between four and nine, maybe 10 nests on a beach during a nesting season. And then she'll take a few years off. So that sounds exhausting to me, right? If we talk about 400 to 900 eggs. But the really interesting thing is they can't start doing that for 25 to 30 years. They don't reach maturity until that age. So they go off as tiny hatchlings, and then in 25 to 30 years later, they go, huh, I guess I'll go home. And they figure out how to get home uh, using Earth's magnetic field, which is, which is pretty incredible. I had to use my GPS to get 15 minutes uh, from, from my home to here. Uh, so turtles are pretty impressive. So they're excellent swimmers. They'll spend all this time. So we know a lot about our different life stages, right? Our hatchlings that we went through, our post hatchlings are, that we don't know much about, juveniles and adults. But when we have them at the marine lab, they're usually this size. So here are our three species that we talked about before that we have in our lab. We have our loggerheads, which usually we describe as it kind of looks like they rolled in the mud, right? When they're tiny, they're almost all brown. And we can see they have these little kind of spiky parts on their shells. Um, we can also identify if we look really close, they have one, two, three, four, five lateral scoots. So that's a good way to tell it's a loggerhead. But if it's brown and spiky and it's in South Florida, probably a loggerhead. We also have our greens. You will notice it is not green. They get that name because as adults, they become vegetarians and even their insides turn green from eating all those plants. Uh, but when we see them, we kind of call them tuxedo turtles. They're dark on the top, almost black. They have one, two, three, four lateral scoots and that belly is bright white. So they will change color over time. This is a juvenile green. So same species, you can see they change color, which is pretty cool. And then probably the most obvious, we have our leatherback in the center. Uh, they do not have hard scoots like we think of for most of our sea turtles. They have a leathery shell uh, and they have seven, what we call dorsal ridges. So they're really big and they're really distinct and they have really, really long flippers. One of the reasons that they have those, uh, that slightly different scale or shell, I should say, is because they are an open ocean species throughout their entire lives. And they're really, really deep divers. So if they dove to those, that, those depths, that shell wouldn't do very well, right? So it's able to bend and, and move around as they're diving almost a mile below the surface, which is, which is pretty incredible. Eating nothing but gelatinous things. So think jellyfish, salps. Uh, they get to be close to 2,000 pounds, some of them. Uh, and we get all three of these species in the marine lab. We're the only uh, facility in the world right now that raises leatherback hatchlings. We'll talk about why that's so difficult and why we're able to do it a little bit uh, a little bit further across. But if you would like to come visit us after this, you're so engaged that you want to come back and hear me and see me covered in fish food and stuff like that, uh, we'll start bringing the leatherbacks in at the beginning of June is usually when they start hatching out and you can see them in the lab. So we get access to these nests and we bring in these hatchlings from beaches in uh, up in Juno Beach and up in, or in, in Boca Raton, Florida. So let me play that animation one more time. So we collaborate with Loggerhead Marine Life Center because we don't get a lot of leatherback nests down here in Boca. So we need to sample from a larger area. There we go. Uh, and you can see we are one of the most densely nested beaches in all of North America. So all of these dots are turtle nests. The different colors represent different species. So lots and lots of loggerheads, like I said before, sprinkled in with some greens and even fewer leatherbacks. But still, think about trying to put your towel down, right? Uh, there's not many places on our beaches that aren't um, part of a sea turtle nest. But remember, they're buried pretty deep down. You don't have to worry about stepping on them. Uh, so we collaborate with different partners to help us figure out what are some good nests for us to study. We also work with Gumbo Limbo Nature Center's Green Turtle Specialist to do the same thing. 
And again, that's where our lab is located right here. So some people have to travel on a plane to a different continent to study these exotic species. I get to go right across the street, which is pretty ideal. Uh, so we get to study these different populations in these different zones. Now I do wanna bring in uh, one thing that makes us different. So I asked if you had been to Gumbo Limbo and I told you there are multiple different partners. So these are some turtles that you may have seen at the nature center in the rehabilitation portion. A few things that are different, right? Giant turtle, missing a flipper. We've got some sick and injured sea turtles and sometimes they even have different species than those that nest on our beaches. This is a hawksbill. They have overlapping scoots. They're really pretty. If you've ever seen like tortoise shell, don't, don't get real tortoise shell. It's probably from a hawksbill, but that's where they get that, that beautiful um, shell from. So they bring in sick and injured sea turtles. Their job is to care for them, fix them up, release them again. We have a slightly different agenda, right? We only bring in healthy turtles. Our job is to keep them that way and then release them after they've helped us answer some questions. So why do we keep healthy turtles? Well, we're trying to learn things about them, right? It's really hard to protect something, really hard to conserve something that you don't know much about. So we bring in those healthy turtles to figure out what's normal. So that way we can continue to conserve and protect those normal ones, not just the ones that are sick and injured. Um, so these are all pictures from our lab. This is me, right? Uh, if you couldn't recognize, and you can see we do work in the lab, we do work in the field, uh, and we'll get to what this turtle, why this turtle looks like it's kind of wearing a backpack in a second. So some of our research nests on the beach, not every nest you see is going to be a research nest. Sometimes uh, Gumbo Limbo or Loggerhead Marine Life Center is just saying, hey, this is a nest because they'll monitor, does it hatch? How well does it do? All that kind of stuff. However, when we uh, use them for research, there are a few things that are different. So three of these are pictures of a research nest. One of them is not. Anyone want to take a guess which one is not one of these things? I won't sing, it's fine. The one that's not a number? Just show me a number. What do we think? One, two, three, four? Four. four. Three. Good guesses, good guesses. All right, the only one that is not a research net is actually number three. Now, I don't expect you to know that. Let me talk, walk you through why, right? Two and four have, if you can see, a cage over them. All right, so when those uh, nests get close to hatching out, if we need to bring in turtles, we have to make sure we get turtles, right? So we put that cage on, not only does it help protect them from predators, but when that nest hatches out, we have someone go at sunset, check the nest, someone go at midnight, check the nest, someone go at sunrise and check the nest. No hatchlings, we open that cage. So if any come out in the middle of the day, they can crawl to the water. But most of the time, just like mom comes up and lays her eggs at night, babies are gonna come up at night. Uh, we think it's a temperature dependent thing. They'll wait until the sand cools. So if you're lucky enough to go to the beach on a rainy day, sometimes you can see baby turtles coming out of the nest because they think it's nighttime because that sand is cooled. None of them are hatching out quite yet. So don't go out in this weather tonight. That's not what I'm telling you to do. Um, but that cage is a good indicator that that's a research nest, right? Someone wants to collect those hatchlings, it's us. It's us, sorry. <laughs> uh, now the only other one, this one's harder, but if you count the stakes, one, two, three, four, compared to one, two, three. Now, that back stake is really important because that back stake is gonna have two letters on it and a few other things, but the two letters I want you to keep in mind are DL, and that stands for data logger. And that's what a data logger is. So a research nest will put one of these in the clutch. So after mom deposits the eggs, we'll insert that in the clutch, you can think of it as a fancy thermometer, okay? It's going to record the temperature of the nest every 15 minutes, the entire time those eggs are in there. So it's gonna store that. We well, might be wondering, why is that important to know the temperature of the nest? Well, sea turtles do not have X and Y chromosomes. So actually what determines if they become males and females is the temperature of the nest. So if you can, a good way to remember this, 
we say hot chicks, cool dudes. Okay, so the warmer the nest, the more females you're going to get, the cooler the nest, the more males that you're going to get. So here in South Florida, in the summer when nesting season is, I think we get more males or females? Mm -hmm. Yes, more females, okay? So we've been doing a long-term study on the sex ratios that are produced on our beaches for about 20 years now. And I always love to tell this story because the director of the Marine Lab, my advisor, Dr. Jeanette Weineken, started this study thinking, hey, let's find a baseline for South Florida. We'll put these data loggers in, get an idea of how many males and females, but other things can impact it, right? Moisture, uh, other sand, grain size. There are a few other things, but we simplify it for temperature. Um, and she's like, we'll just see what the baseline is. This will be great. It was so skewed female that we thought, hmm, we might be on the precipice of something bad, right? On average, we get between 85 and 95% females. Historically, about one third have been males and about two thirds have been females. So we're trying to figure out, is this sustainable or are we gonna have to try, try to start doing some conservation, some mitigation? Um, but like I said, it takes 25 to 30 years for these animals to contribute to the population. So, so far things are going well, right? But we're only 20 years in. So yeah. You mentioned early on that if it's cool season, they take longer to develop. Yes. So does that impact the males versus females? Yeah, that's a really good point because all of these things are kind of intertwined, right? We do know to some degree, male hatchlings are a tiny bit bigger. And we also know that really hot nests often don't produce really well. Or if it gets super hot, they might come out with abnormalities that probably impact their survival, right? Sometimes they'll get an extra scoop. Sometimes they'll have a cleft palate. We see that those anomalies increase as it gets hotter. Um, so yes, I would, I would guess those males that do come out, they're big, they're chunky, they're probably doing well um, compared to those females. But if we look at our data here, it's so skewed, males and females. So this is the data that we've collected over 20 years. This is just loggerheads. So this is the species that we get the most of between 2005 and 2006. One year we did greens, one year we did uh, leatherbacks. We've been doing all three for about the last three years. But you can see some years we don't find a single male. Now we've modeled it and we think that if every four years we average about 25% males, we'll probably be okay. It's pretty close, right? It's not looking great. Um, so we're trying to figure out, again, what's sustainable. Maybe we find that males travel more. They contribute to more populations than our females. It's a lot easier to know about females because they come on shore. Our males don't do that. After hatchlings, they'll never see the sand again unless, I don't know, something goes wrong, right? Uh, so this is some of the things that, some of the data that we've collected over the years trying to figure out is this sustainable for our population? Uh, what are some things that we'll have to do if it's not? We've done studies on, okay, can we make males by watering nests, by shading nests? How easy is that to do for one of the most densely nested beaches in all of North America? Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that we're most well known for. And this is one of the reasons that we raise hatchlings in our lab. So when you bring them in as hatchlings, you can't tell if they're males or females. I told you they're a little bit bigger, maybe like 0.2 millimeters. It's statistically significant. We've done a study on it, but I don't know about you. I can't eyeball that and I'd have to have something to compare it to. So we also can't wait 25 to 30 years when they start showing those characteristics. So instead we raise them to 120 grams, which you can think of as about the size of your hand. Then that yolk sac that they've been absorbing since the time they were hatchlings, is completely out of the way. All the bits are on the inside. So we just have to look internally and tell if they're males or females. So after they reach that size, we can look. Okay, great. Then we give them a nice boat ride out to the Gulf Stream where they'll live out the rest of their lives. And again, here's what they look like when they're in the lab. And when we care for them in the lab, you'll see that we take care of them in a few different ways. So we've got our leatherbacks over here. I told you earlier, they're open ocean species throughout their entire lives. 
Do you notice anything different between these two? We're feeding them right now and I'll show you a video, but these guys are in baskets, right? And this guy, if you look really closely, is almost on a little tether or a little leash that's attached to his back there. And he's being hand fed. These guys were able to dive for their cubes. That's very purposeful, okay? We take care of the different species in different ways because they have different life histories, different ways that they move around. I'll show you a video of these guys as well. You can ignore the thin pan, it's just water. So we can feed these other rats. You can get a good look at that tether there. Looks like it might be buffered a little bit. So because these guys are open ocean species throughout their entire lives, they don't recognize barriers well. There aren't a lot of walls in the open ocean. So because of that, anytime people have tried to keep them in captivity, they just keep running into the sides of the tank. And they do that and it's stressful and they hurt themselves and they end up not doing well, getting sick, maybe even dying. So instead, we almost put them on what's like a little treadmill, right? We're gonna put them on this tether. They can swim to their hearts, Content, right? They'll swim almost continuously, uh, but they're not going to run into anything. They're not going to get stressed. We feed them by hand three times a day and they get a fresh water shower. They live a better life than I do from time to time, right? Or take care, better care of themselves. Whereas our loggerheads and our greens, this one's not in a basket, but for the most part, we're gonna keep them in those baskets that you saw earlier, because when they're out in the open ocean, they like to associate with floating mats of seaweed or sargas. So if you've ever walked on the beach and that big pile of smelly stuff that comes up, not great on the beach, wonderful in the ocean. So these turtles have that shell for protection, right? That shell isn't super helpful if something you swallow you whole. So for the first year or two of their lives, they will hide in those floating mats of seaweed, opportunistically feeding on little bugs and invertebrates, but also hiding from things that might wanna eat them. A fun fact that we've learned from the marine lab and monitoring their growth rates, for the first year or two, these turtles are growing wider than they are long or growing faster wide than they do long because they're trying to limit how, those, how many predators can fit them in their mouths, right? I envision those turtles like, nope, you can't eat me, right? If they get wide enough. So you can see this one is almost, I like to call them pancake turtles, right? It's a pretty round turtle. And then after they reach a certain size, they'll start to lengthen out and get a bit more hydrodynamic. Um, so again, they're just trying not to get eaten. These guys love floating mats of seaweed in those tight nooks and crannies. Uh, so that's why we keep them in those baskets and attempt to mimic that environment. These guys want nothing to do with it. They are open ocean creatures their entire lives. They will swim out in the open ocean. Uh, and that doesn't change from the time they're adults to when they're this time. And here's just another view of how we care for them. So, yep, you saw that little tether before. We keep them spaced out so they don't get tangled, right? And they have this little swivel so they can swim in whatever direction they want to, whereas these guys are in those little baskets. Uh, they're not social creatures, right? They don't want to be best friends with each other. They might bite each other's slippers if they get too close. So that's one of the reasons we keep them separated as well. And then, like I said, after their brief stay with us, once they reach 120 grams, we give them a nice boat ride out to the Gulf Stream. So that current that's to our east, right, where that ocean is, um, varies. Sometimes it's seven miles offshore. Sometimes it's up to 18 miles offshore. We make sure to get them in that current uh, and then we release them. So again, we bring in healthy turtles we release those healthy turtles as well. Just release them so they can swim. That's the natural kind of thing. Yeah, great question, great question. So you might have seen maybe like a sea turtle release on the beach, yeah? So as hatchlings, great, fantastic. They're in the middle of what's called their frenzy stage. So think of if you were a baby newly born and instead of, you know, you can't crawl, you can't do anything, you came out sprinting. That's what turtles do, okay? So they're still absorbing that yolk sac, for 24 to 48 hours, they're just going. They don't have to stop to eat or anything. After those 48 hours, they get really lazy, right? Because they're normally hiding in those floating mats of seaweed. So if we tried to release them from the beach, they wouldn't make it past the waves. If you've ever come to a rehabilitation center and they'd say, these are our washbacks, 
we would be, they, all of our turtles would be washbacks. They might get a little bit further out and then they'd come back. So we take them to where they would be at that natural stage. Now, once they reach that juvenile stage that I pointed out where they do come back to those closer coastal waters, totally fine. Big mamas, big daddies, totally fine. You can release them from, from that shore. But this weird life stage that we don't know much about where they're spending time in the open ocean, they're not gonna make it past the waves. So great question. So yes, oh yeah, absolutely. What's the impact on the turtles going to be with this 5,000 mile uh, sea wind? Yeah, yeah, right. So that's a good question and something that we're wondering as well. Like I said, sargasm on the beaches, We've done some studies. Not only is it annoying and stinky for us. Oh, sorry. I don't need that anyway. Yeah, I, actually, I might need that to change the slide. Hold on one second. Technical difficulties. <laughs> All right. So yeah, let's talk about that seaweed. Let's talk about that sargasm. So like I said, on the beaches, annoying to us. And if it gets too tall, if it gathers in too big amounts, we know that our sea turtle hatchlings can't make it to the water. So we've done studies that say that if it gets over a foot tall, those turtles aren't gonna be able to scale it. Um, below that, still pretty impressive. They can make it over, but it's probably going to take longer, probably more likely to get eaten by something in the process. Um, but in the water, good hiding spots for those turtles. One thing that we're interested in is, is it so big? Is it so massive that those little things that live in it, that call it home, maybe maybe their food source is now too spread out in that giant mass, uh, mass, that it won't be a good thing. We don't know the answer to that. It's so large that yes, it's gonna provide hiding spots, but maybe that food is more spread out than it usually is. Um, so that's a good question and something that we're trying to figure out as well. Yeah. Do you have any idea why that occurs? So there are a few things that will cause blooms of things like algae or seaweed and things like that. It's usually an influx of fertilizer, aquatic fertilizers, right? So things like nitrogens and phosphates and a perfect combination of that mixed with temperature and currents. So it's a it's a mixture of a bunch of things uh, that have led to that bloom. Um, it is a naturally occurring thing, but in that large amount, not as natural. Yeah. But you have hand fed them. Yeah, that's a great question. We're actually gonna get to that. Can we get there? Yeah, excellent. Perfect, you read my mind. Perfect segue. All right, so you guys might be wondering, right, if we're inevitably head starting these turtles, right? That's not why we do it, but more or less, we're, we're keeping them for a few months. It takes them two to four months to reach 120 grams. How does that impact their survival? And that's a question we had as well. And also, I told you this is a really mysterious life stage. So now we have access to these turtles that most people don't even see. Where are they going? Are they surviving? Uh, and what impact are they gonna have? So when we release them, sometimes we get to put tiny satellite tags on these tiny turtles. So they are just about at the right size where technology has improved. If you've ever seen a satellite tag on a really big turtle, um, it's quite large. We couldn't put them on tiny turtles for a really long time. Uh, we still can't put them on hatchlings, but when they reach 120 grams, Believe it or not, this tag only weighs about 2.5 grams, which is pretty incredible. So it's such a small part of their body weight, we can attach these tags to these turtles. Uh, we've done it on leatherbacks, we've done it on green turtles, and we can monitor where they're going. So as long as that satellite uh, antenna sticks out of the water, which it's gonna do every time they breathe, right? Our turtles are vertebrates, they do have lungs, they do need to breathe air, though they're much better at holding their breath than I am. Uh, then we can tell exactly where they're going and if they're surviving, right? Because that tag will sink to the bottom if the turtle sinks to the bottom, right? Or if it gets eaten by a fish or something like that that doesn't have to breathe, uh, then that satellite tag is not going to do anything. And this is called the lost years, right? So I told you 
For a long time, we had no idea where they were spending their time. Kind of the grandfather of sea turtle biology, Archie Carr, deemed these things the lost years. Because like I said, we know they were living, but where they were spending their time, how they were spending their time, we didn't know. They were lost, data deficient years. And now we're starting to answer some of those questions. So this is a paper that came out, um, I believe in 2016, uh, collaborators from our lab. All of these tracks are tiny turtles. The Orient U, here's Florida, right? Eastern coast of the US. We've got turtles going all the way out here. These different colors represent different water temperatures. Uh, so these are green turtles. This is one of our first tagging studies of the lost years. They swim for hundreds and thousands of miles, right? Sometimes they catch a little, uh, catch a ride on that current that's taking them this way out to the Sargasso Sea. But we know that when we compare that data to passive drifters, so we'll put out these turtles and then we'll put out a similar tag, but on something that's just gonna float with the currents and they don't go the same places. Sometimes they do, but inevitably, something changes. So we know that there is some active dispersal as well, and that's something we're actively studying. We should have a grad student who studies how sea turtles swim, right? It's me, it's me, right? Uh, so that's one of the questions that we're answering. So this is where uh, our greens went a couple of years ago. I do have some data from this past, uh, past season of our loggerheads. So we partnered with uh, Upwell Turtles. They do a lot of this tagging. We tagged four different loggerheads and you'll see where each of them go, right? We started here in Florida. In four weeks, they had made it this far. Eight weeks, they had made it all the way out here. And 10 weeks, they made it all the way out here. Now you may have noticed, we started with four dots. How many do we end with? We ended with three. Now, before we get sad, <laughs> these tags, are created to fall off, right? These turtles are growing very, very fast. And that tag is going to pop off at some given time. They're supposed to stay on for about 12 weeks. So maybe that tag fell off, maybe that turtle got eaten, right? After 10 weeks, uh, there's no way for us to know, right? Once it stops uh, tracking. But one thing we do know is if these turtles are surviving 10, 12, sometimes two months that we've seen on some of those other tracks, they're doing okay. They're finding that food. They're doing what they need to do. They're, they're living. Um, and we estimate when they leave the beach, about one in a thousand will survive to adulthood. One in a thousand. Mm -hmm. So 75% after 10 weeks, are odds than, than what they had naturally, at least what we think. Right. How far out in the ocean is that? Are they midway between Europe and the States? Or yes, that... more or less. I wish I should have included a full thing. So if you look at the Atlantic Ocean and you look at those currents, right kind of in the middle between the US and the west coast of Africa is what's called the Sargasso Sea. So we see like a gyre or a current going in a circle, Sargasso, that's where that sargassum comes from. Uh, and a lot of times, They'll go in that little current, they'll go off in little gyres, do what they need to do, come back in it. Um, so yeah, hundreds, hundreds of miles with some help from the current, right? Um, and then as adults, they'll make the trip back. Sometimes we'll see them once they reach adulthood, go up here in colder waters to forage before coming back down here. Um, and it's not like the same turtles from the same nesting beach always go the same places to forage, which is also very interesting. So that's some of the work that we've done to track these turtles during those lost years and how we know that even though we're making their lives pretty easy in the lab, they're able to take care of themselves once they get out here. Any other questions about that portion of things? I have a question. Yes, yes, I have. I'll see, do you have a question? Oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead and I'll come right back to you. Return to the place they were born to lay eggs for their future. Yes. So, yes, with an asterisk. So, the question was do they return to the same beach where they were laid as eggs to lay their own eggs? That's something called natal homing. And yes, sea turtles exhibit natal homing. We think they come back to the same nesting region. 
Now, when we say the same nesting beach, a lot of times people think, okay, this nest was laid on, you know, outside my, my patio, and they'll come back 25 to 30 years later. By nesting beach, that beach could be 100 miles, right? Could be closer to 250 miles. Some turtles, our leatherbacks have a broader idea of what a nesting beach is. They could be hundreds of miles apart, but still return to like Florida or the East Coast of the US. Whereas some of our other species like our loggerheads might be a little bit more consistent. That range is a little bit closer to tens to hundreds of miles. But yes, and we try to give the caveat of, it depends on what your definition of a beach is, but yes, they'll come back to the same area. And we know that they can do that based on Earth's magnetic field. It's a, not only, um, if anyone's interested in the literature, Ken Lowen at the University of North Carolina has done a lot of great work. We've collaborated with him on it and stuff, but we know that in whatever, we don't know where it is, but they know that they can use, they can navigate as if they have a compass, but also as if they have a GPS. So not only can they determine, mm, this is probably north, but they can also say, latitude, longitude, I wanna go here, which is pretty cool. Yes. I said I would come back to you. And then, yes, I see your questions. Absolutely. Talking about nests, uh, you mentioned that the turtles build their nests very deep into the ground. Yeah. Well, how, do you have devices that can, can uh, figure out where they are? Yeah, great question. Great question. So the question, for those of you on, on Zoom, I want to make sure you can hear, was we said that they're burying these nests feet into the ground, right? About at least to my elbow probably to my shoulder if it's a leatherback or even deeper, right? We've got a picture of one of our techs who's standing in a leatherback nest about up to here. Uh, so the question was like, how do we find that nest? How do we, do we have devices that know where they are? And those devices for now are people. And there's a really good, we've got a great folks at Loggerhead Marine Life Center and uh, our gumbo limbo marine turtle specialists. It's really cool to see. You'll see tracks coming out of the water based on what those tracks are or what they look like, you can tell what species it is. You can see some sort of kerfluffle happened in the sand. And based on where some of that sand is, they've got a pretty good idea of, oh, it's probably around here. Now, some of those nests are so deep, especially our leatherbacks. I've dug 20, 30 holes and we still haven't found them. So they are very good moms. But when they're a bit shallower, they're a little bit easier to find. Uh, and that's how we do it, right? We, we dig until, oh, all of a sudden you get to maybe some warm sand or you get to an air pocket and you see those things. Um, but train people can identify what species it is and about where that nest is. So, yes. Are those beaches cordoned off between October and June? They are not. But if you walk on the beach, um, remember those pictures I showed you of the stakes? Yeah, that's what you'll see. And at, in Boca, they'll do that for all the nests. Up in Juno Beach, uh, they're a bit more densely nested. If they did that, there'd be no place to put your towel. Uh, they do a subsection of those, depending on the species, depending on which part of the beach. Um, but again, because they're so deep, you could, yeah, you walk on them, it's okay. Now, if we have like a big erosion event or something like that, then nests can be exposed and, and all those things, but you don't really need to worry. Try not to dig really deep holes. Um, or if you do dig holes, be sure to cover them up because that could be bad for moms and little hatchlings. Um, but yeah, you don't have to worry about those things. Those little guys can break their way all the way up to the sand. Yeah. yeah. So they exhibit what the question was, can they break through their little egg and crawl all the way up there? Yes. And they do it kind of by working together. So they'll hatch out of their eggs. We call it synchronized emergence. So they might hatch out at, uh, at different times. Um, but then all at once, they'll decide to crawl out together. So we think maybe that's for a few reasons. Maybe it's easier to get out of the sand when a hundred of your siblings are helping you to, to go in the same direction. We also think it has something to do with what we call predator swamping, right? If you're the only tiny thing making it to the water, you are easy pickings for a bird, something like that. If there's a hundred of you, one of you might get eaten, right? But the 99 might make it. Um, so we think there's a few different reasons behind that. Um, but yeah, we've been doing some, some studies as well to figure out how do they know it's time to go, right? How do they, are they elbowing each other through the eggs? Like, hey, time to get out of here. Um, and we don't have any definitive answers yet. Maybe it's mechanical stimulation. They do vocalize as well. Uh, but we're trying to figure out what some of those cues are. Yes. What 
you know what the impact of the temperature raising in the oceans is going to be on the various Yes, yes. So as we question was, uh, how will increasing temperatures of the oceans, how will that have an impact on sea turtles? Uh, and there's a few different ways. Obviously, we've talked about the in impacts of an, a warmer beach, right? How that will in impact the development of those turtles in the eggs, that kind of stuff. Now, warmer waters could you know, that's going to affect productivity depending on what those turtles are eating. Um, we've seen that in some populations that we call it a remigration interval. I told you they come back every two to three years to lay their eggs. Uh, we're seeing in some populations the Pacific leatherback thing looks like that. That remigration interval is getting bigger and bigger. We think maybe it's because they're not getting the same amount of nutrients. Things have changed. You know, it's really expensive to lay hundreds of eggs. So you have to make sure you get enough resources before you make that hundreds of mile journey and then deposit all those eggs. Uh, temperature might play a role in that and how it's impacting their food source. Um, we don't know when turtles, right? I told you they travel hundreds of miles up the coast here and then who knows what the weather's like in Florida if you don't have a TV, right? But they decide, oh, yep, time to turn around, time to go back. Uh, is that sea surface temperature? Maybe that's an indicator of those things, and maybe that might cause them to make that migration sooner. Um, maybe it's a combination of things like daylight, you know, how much daylight, hours, things like that. Um, so we don't really necessarily know the impact of those things yet. Sea level rise, which goes along with that temperature increase, uh, there's fewer places to lay your nests on the beach. I, I mean, if you guys have been to the beach lately, I know we had a renourishment area right across the street that just finished up, pretty much all gone after the storm here today. Uh, if there's no beach to, to lay your eggs, then that's a problem as well. Um, so we're not totally sure of all of those impacts, but those are things that that could contribute to. Yes. You mentioned that they, after they lay their eggs, well, first of all, they come in, but is there a mating process before they Come in with their eggs. Yes. Then they lay the eggs and they go off. And they have to find another male. Those are great questions. All right, the questions are about mating, right? I told you they come onto the beach, they lay their eggs, but uh, somehow those eggs got fertilized, right? If they're going to hatch out into, into babies. So we do know that they mate offshore of those same beaches. So they're not doing it up in the foraging grounds up here. They are mating offshore. I can't tell you how many times I've had people, you know, I'm doing my work on the beach and they come running up and they're flagging me down. They're like, there are two injured turtles out there together struggling to breathe. And I have to be like, they're, they're, they're fine. They're doing okay. Uh, so all of that mating takes place offshore of, of those state nesting beaches. Uh, and the cool thing is, she can mate with multiple males and she can store the sperm from multiple males. So if you do like a paternity test or you look at the genetics of all of the hatchlings that come out of a single nest, there are going to be multiple fathers. So, uh, and that will be true of multiple nests in a season. So she doesn't necessarily have to mate with a male in between every single nest. Uh, and she can mate with multiples and say, hey, you'll all contribute to this, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. You had that map of different nests. Yeah. Are nests further from the water more successful Great or question. the ones near the water? We'll go back because it's a good it's a good representation of what we have here. <laughs> Sorry for making anyone seasick. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the question was depending on how close to the water or close to the dune, does that determine the success of the nest or have any impact on those things? Um, yes, in a few different ways. So if we get a nest that's close to the water, it might get washed over a few times. A few times is fine. If it gets inundated, remember these are porous eggs, oxygen's gotta come in and out for them to survive. Those embryos can inevitably drown if they get too wet. 
So too close to the water, not a great thing. But if you're close enough to get washed over a few times, maybe you'll get some boys because moisture is going to help cool down the nest as well. If you're up around the dune, going to be really dry. Maybe you get some shade from the dune. Maybe you don't, right? Um, so that will help keep you dry, but it also might make you more exposed to the elements. We also see some cool trends between species. Uh, we get lots of loggerhead nests. They tend to be lazy sometimes. They're mostly going to nest mid-beach. If we ever get nests that are really close to the water, there's a good chance it's a loggerhead. Um, our greens nest pretty much right up next to the dune. We've had some that have, you know, it looks like the dune's gonna cave in on them and they're like, nope, this is great, this is perfect, this is right where I wanna lay my nest. Uh, and then our leatherbacks are somewhere in between. Very rarely do they nest right next to the water, um, but they're not all the way up in the dune uh, as well. So yes and no, could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. We've also looked at do certain moms prefer different parts of the beach? Not really. Yes. Will they have an innate sense of where they should be for safety with children? Where they should be for safety in the water, on the beach, on the beach. On the beach. Have a sense of, uh, of safety for, for like the moms? Like what's a good Yeah. Yeah. So um I don't know if it's an innate sense of safety, but we do see a few things. Our turtles can get spooked. We could have made this graph even more, or this map even more uh, covered in symbols if we also put in what we call false crawls. And you might even, I think there might, they might even be on here, some of these triangles. So a false crawl is a turtle came up, went back into the water without laying her eggs. A few things could happen, right? Maybe she comes up, she's like, nah, this is not it. This is not where I want to deposit my eggs. Maybe she got spooked. Uh, we know that lighting is something that can, can spook our turtles or can also disorient our turtles. So do they crawl towards the lowest and brightest horizon? If you don't turn your lights off and you live on the beach, that can be a major deterrent or your hatchlings can crawl that way. Um, but once they decide to start laying their eggs, once they've dug a good egg chamber and they're already depositing those eggs, it's gonna take a lot to spook that turtle and go back into the water. Once she starts, um, almost like they go into, it's been deemed like a trance of some sort. They're gonna finish what they're doing and then they're going to go back. So some of that decision-making of, is this safe? Is this a good beach? It's done when she first comes up or when she first starts digging that body pit for herself, but not after she's started depositing those eggs, or very rarely. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, of course. How, yeah. How big are the turtles that are coming on the beach to lay their eggs? Yeah, great question. Let's, I want to give you a visual here. These are tiny turtles. Very first. So many animations. So sorry for, oh, there we go. Okay, so. Largest turtle, leatherback could be about six feet long, sometimes seven feet long. I've seen 800 pounds. Supposedly some can make it up to 2,000 pounds, right? Probably closer to 1,000 is, is more accurate of them as a whole. So that could be one. Uh, our loggerheads, three and a half feet, but still weighing about 350 pounds. Um, and then our greens, a little bit bigger, four and a half feet. Yeah, you'd be surprised though, right? They they are sneakier than you think they are uh, when they're coming up. And again, because hopefully it's a it's a dark beach. If it's a full moon, they'll put on a show, watch from a distance, right? We never want to spook them and keep them. But yes, they are very large, uh, and you'll be able to see them. Yeah. So if it takes 25 days for them to get to a place where they start to lay eggs, yeah. what is the lifespan? Ooh, great question. Uh, what is the lifespan of a sea turtle? Uh, that's a tough question, right? If we've seen Finding Nemo, they're like, oh, 108 or something like that. Uh, we know that tortoises, like giant tortoises in the Galapagos, can live over 100 years or something like that. It's harder to tell for sea turtles because we don't raise them in captivity. They're harder to find out in the open ocean. We estimate that they have about the same lifespan as a human, right? Some of us might live 
40 years, 50 years, some of us don't make it over 100 years old. Um, the best proxy that we have for age, so when a mom comes up to lay her eggs, we'll measure her carapace length, so that's the hard part of the shell on her back, and based on that length, we can estimate how old she is because we think they continue to grow throughout their entire lives, but that's going to be dependent on the water temperature that they spend time in, how good their food source is. So one of the most accurate ways we know to determine how old a turtle is, um, their humerus bone, similar to rings on a tree, will get a ring every year. Uh, so if you get the cross section of a humerus bone, you can estimate how old that turtle was. To get the cross section of a humerus bone, though, you have to have a dead turtle. There's really no way to access that. Yeah, absolutely. Years, right, right. Uh, the question was, why does it take that long? I don't know the answer to that, right? They're, they're kind of an anomaly, right? Because if we think about how they choose to reproduce, I'm going to lay a lot of eggs, and then only a few are going to survive. Usually we see that in really short-lived animals, but these guys are weird because they do that, but then they don't reach maturity until forever, right? Like some fish will lay hundreds or thousands of eggs and they'll only survive for one year and say like, that's it. These guys are laying hundreds of eggs every year, but they're also really long-lived species. So that's pretty unique that those two things are paired together. So my real answer is I don't know, but it's cool, right? And it's, it's unique and it's interesting. So have researchers dug down into the nests after they've all gone to see what's left down there to see if they've had 50% that didn't? Absolutely, yes. So uh, our collaborators that I spoke to you about, they do that for pretty much every single nest that they mark. So they do that for hundreds of nests. We get to do it for our few research nests. So we try to get a handful from the early, mid, and late part of the season to get a good idea of what's produced throughout the whole year. Uh, we usually bring in between nine to maybe 15 nests for each species. Um, but yes, one of our questions is, you know, how, how successful are they? All, are they all hatching? We know that our loggerheads and our greens, pretty high hatch success, just historically. Our leatherbacks, hovering around 50%. So we have a graduate student right now that's trying to figure out what's going on with leatherbacks, right? Why are they not hatching out as successfully uh, as the other species? But yes, we do that. Um, this last season was pretty interesting, right? You might've seen a newspaper article that's like record setting nesting year, all that, but it was so hot and dry, we had a really low hatching success year. So yes, there were lots of nests, but not as many hatchlings per nest if those nests were developing at all. So yes, people do that. And they also can stage, was this a turtle that almost made it out or did this egg not even develop? Was it an infertile egg? Because that's the other question, right? If we don't have enough males, are we even gonna have fertile eggs? And that's another question that uh, that graduate student is looking at the impact of leatherbacks has. Yes? Do they succumb to disease? Do they succumb to disease? Yes. Um, if we look, Thank you for your patience. Uh, I just have a good, here's one. Oh. So we do know that they do get some diseases. This uh, tumor is called fibropapillomatosis or FP. We see these really big tumors that develop mostly in green turtles. Uh, the tumors themselves aren't really an issue, but if they get so big that it impedes, like maybe they get one close to their mouth and they can't feed. Maybe they get one by their eye and they can't see. Uh, that can be an issue. Um, we do know that there are, there's another SAM that works in our lab that's looking at some of the fungal infections that we see in our hatchlings. And is that coming from the beach itself? Is it something that's developed from the water? Is it coming from mom? Um, so the answer is yes, but it's a little bit hard to, to diagnose. And again, we bring in healthy turtles. if that's what we're trying to do, right? As much as we can tell, and our job is to keep them that way. So at least the marine lab, not a common occurrence. Yeah, uh, go back, finish. Up. Yes, yes. <laughs> there was only one more slide. So oh, you guys, good. yeah, don't worry, don't worry. You okay. guys picked a good time to ask questions. Uh, I wasn't sure. 
No, I appreciate it. Keep us on track here. So just to sum up, there are some really cool things that we do at the Marine Lab. Uh, our, our main purpose, right, is to inspire curiosity, inquiry, and discovery, and our studies center on revealing scientific discoveries of importance to marine environments. Uh, and it's really unique that we get to have conversations with you guys uh, like this. And one of the reasons that I came to the lab, I love talking with you guys. Um, some people sit at a, at a bench and use a pipette every day. I get to talk to people that like turtles like you pretty much every day. So yes, I have time for questions. Absolutely. So have you noticed between the different nesting beaches, different success rates? Ooh, different success rates across different nesting beaches. Um, of the two beaches we look at, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying the statistics, that's people that monitor those beaches and don't just look at the research nests would have a better idea of those things. Um, Population-wise, yes, we see that some have a higher hatch success than others. Um, we've done some studies in our lab to try to figure out, okay, up and down the East Coast, what makes a great nesting beach? And the paper that came out of that said, it depends, right? We've got some that are really hot. We have some that are really cool. We have big grain size. We have low grain size. They're all historically high hatch success, and they all did pretty well and had very little in common. So is my answer, I guess. Yeah. Global warming. Yeah. Between the male and the female species. Yes. The warming of the sands. And, yeah. Um, is that being studied also? And yeah, yeah. So uh, a big question, the question was on global warming, right? And one of the reasons that we still have our study going on is because of climate change, right? A few different things are going to happen with climate change. Yes, we're going to get warmer beaches. I don't know what your, what your feelings are on climate change from our last 20 years. Our beaches are getting, our, our beaches have gotten warmer over those 20 years. So that data we're going on, that's happening. Um, climate change could mean more extreme storms, right? So maybe that'll pull down nests, but maybe that'll also wash out nests. So there are a lot of impacts and that's part of what we're doing here. So we, we monitor not only temperature, but that daily rainfall and all that kind of stuff to get an idea of what's, what's gonna be the normal or the new normal. Yeah. Question for you. Um, you go out at night and you see the turtles nesting. Yeah. That's how you get your measurements. Are they skittish, or how long does that process take that you actually get to see the turtles? And then is the public allowed to see the turtles or just happen upon it? Yeah, great question, great question. So uh, we are very lucky to live in South Florida where these things are literally going on. Tur turtles are nesting in our backyards. Um, a few things to keep in mind. They are an endangered species. Uh, so you are required by law to keep a safe distance and not scoop them in any way, right? I have a permit in order to do what I do. Um, if we happen across a turtle, and a lot of what we do, right, as the title suggests, I work with tiny turtles. But to get tiny turtles, we have to know where the big turtles were at some point in time. Um, so like I had mentioned a little bit before, if they're just coming out of the water, I don't move, right? I wait for her to make up her mind. I wait for her to pass me. Um, because if I make any sudden movements, if I sneeze, sometimes I don't see her, right? Sometimes they're giant, but I still don't see them and I get spooked and she gets spooked and she goes back into the water and I feel bad. Um, she'll come up a little bit further down the beach, it'll be okay. Um, we don't do any measurements or anything at that point. Once she starts depositing her eggs, that's when she said, I've made my decision. I'm going to stay here for the next maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe an hour, sometime, you know, to lay a hundred eggs takes a while. Um, so that's when usually people, if it's us or if it's our collaborators, are taking those measurements, uh, making those things during that time, or better yet, not necessarily when she's laying those eggs, if it's something more invasive, maybe when she's trying to cover those eggs back up again. And then can you repeat for the people on Zoom um, yeah. about the marine lab and when people can visit? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so if you didn't get all of your fill on turtles here tonight, uh, the FAU Marine Lab is located at the Gumbo Limbo Environmental Complex. So if you put Gumbo Limbo in your phone on A1A, uh, right now 
We don't have any turtles. They've all reached that size of your hand. Uh, they've been released, but there are already eggs on the beach right now that are developing. So I would come back if you really want to see turtles. Early June is when we'll start bringing in those leatherbacks. Um, and that would be a good time. And after June, usually June through the end of May, uh, end of March, we always have turtles. These are kind of the two months where I get to come talk to people like you because I don't have to be in the lab. Um, but yes, we're right off of A1A between Palmetto and Spanish River. Yeah, and see, see, my navigation's not that bad. Not as good as a, as a turtle, but. Faith hope for the turtles because your enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, I appreciate it. But, but this has been so amazing. Fantastic. I appreciate that so much. Yeah, I think enthusiasm is contagious. So that's good. That's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys all so much for being here. I couldn't do it without your talking. Yeah, you mentioned that they can navigate. With like a GPS like yeah. Like, yeah. How do they know that? So uh like how do researchers know that or kind of turtles? How are they able to tell that? that yes. So there are some pretty cool studies. Uh they build this cube, right? Out of and they send electrical current one way, giving them the exact magnetic address of like your latitude, and the other way for your longitude, because the magnetic field you have intensity and inclination angle, which serve similar to latitude and longitude, not those great 90 degree angles necessarily. But we know that if we give them a certain magnetic signature, they swim one direction. If instead we tell them, oh, you're not actually in Florida, you're out in the middle of here, then they all swim in a different direction. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And I'm oversimplifying, and if someone, if Kevin was watching this right now, I'm so sorry because I've probably oversimplified things. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool stuff to see how they're changing those things and how if you think you're here, you'll swim this way. And if you think you're here, you'll swim a different way. Okay, so you create an artificial magnetic field and see how they react. Yeah. And can you shield the real magnetic field when you do when you do those tests? Yes. So they find my understanding is they find an area. A very specific area where they can do those things. I'll send you the paper. If you give me your email address, I'll send you the paper. But, how you set up the conditions to test something like that? Yeah, yeah. It. I helped them build. I helped them build the cube last summer. It's pretty intense, but it's good stuff. That's true with a lot of species, like the swallows coming back to Cap Toronto, the butterflies always coming back or nesting in certain places. Yeah, yeah, we know that, right, we know that some of them definitely have a compass, and we know that some of them can do that, right? Some of our butterflies, they fly back to a place they've never even been before, right? At least our turtles have been there and they were this big before coming back 25 to 30 years later. Um, but yeah, animals are pretty incredible uh, and make me feel bad about using my GPS every time. Yeah. yeah. Has there been tracking of a turtle that actually has stayed on for 25 years and that you can track it when it comes back? Great question, great question. So have we tracked a turtle, hatchling goes into the water, comes back 25 to 30 years later, and we can say, yes, look, it came back to the same beach it was laid on. No, <laughs> are we trying to do that? Yeah. So like I said, uh, tiny turtles require tiny tags. We haven't made them tiny enough for hatchling yet. But what we can do, we can take a tiny little skin biopsy when they come out, we can get the genetic material of that, and we can test them on when they come back later. Um, so there are some ways that we're trying to do it. Has anyone done it yet? No, but fingers crossed. So the reason that we know they're coming back to the same nesting beach or general region is based on genetics. Yeah. So because they're endangered, are there laws now where hotels and apartments need to turn their lights off at night? Yes, it's difficult to enforce. Um, but yes, every time I'm walking on the beach with my bucket, right, when I, instead of calling me turtle girl, which seems appropriate, I've been deemed bucket girl, which seems less appropriate, but I do have a bucket. Um, so when I'm out there, anytime I see one, I'll take a picture, I'll send it to FWC and say, hey, these lights are on. Um, but we have so many 
people that live along our beaches here, it's, it's really tough. What we do as, as researchers in the morning, if a nest emerged and we see a lot of misorientation or disorientation. So misorientation, tracks going every which way. Disorientation, I am going this way and the water's that way, right? So they're going the wrong way. Uh, we're required or whoever's monitoring that beach is required that if they see a certain range of misorientation or disorientation to record it and report it. So in that way, yes. But um, yes, there are laws, rules, regulations. Uh, there is beach friendly lighting. If you want to tie in my master's work, turtles are not as good at seeing long wavelengths. So that's why if you ever see like red light or orange light, they are less likely to crawl towards that or it needs to be much brighter for them to see it as opposed to white light, blue light, those kinds of things. So they're in danger because of what's happening on the beaches for nesting more so than what's happening in the ocean or oh. them getting eaten by stuff or, or, or pollution in the ocean or any other crazy thing. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Why why are they endangered? What what are some of their main threats? Some of that is what's happening on the beaches. Entanglement issues, uh, getting caught in fishing line and all that. Now there have been developments, right? If you go to Gumbo Limbo, you'll see there's a turtle excluder device, and kids can like go through it and stuff. So they've developed things for like trawling nets that you can get everything you want fish wise, and the turtle's strong enough to get out of it. Um, so there are ways of that, but long line fisheries are, are a big thing. Um, they do have some predators. So I wouldn't say that we know for a fact it's definitely just what's happening on the beach. There are other dangerous things out there, but it's really hard for us to gather data on those things in the same way that we do on the beach. Because like I said, we know a lot about hatchlings because they're on the beach. We know a lot about nesting moms because they're on the beach. Same thing with our threats. Uh, we don't get out in the open ocean as much as we are on the beach. So I think we have a better understanding of those threats would be my, my interpretation. Yeah. If they're going toward the light, do um, you ever put lights to help them get to the right direction? Great question, great question. So if they're following light to the water, why don't we just put a big light out there and they'll follow it that way? Yeah. Um, would it work? Yeah, probably. Now, uh, the other thing is that's more or less a, a Band-Aid on, on a bigger issue. So I haven't seen that used as a, as a strategy because one, they can only see things through a, a narrow field. So we would have to have so many lights out in the water and the impact that might have on other things. Um, well, I'm just thinking yeah. more along with, you know, having maybe, you know, like an animal there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that would, it, I, I will tell you, you're not the first person to have that idea. Uh, our, I think in general, the thinking is, let's make this as natural as possible. Um, we just turn ours off as opposed to introducing something new in there. And like I said before, that might even keep them from, from nesting on our beaches, right? If they only nest in the dark and all of a sudden it's, an airport runway, then maybe they wouldn't even want to nest on that beach in the first place. Turn it on until they were heading. Yeah, they overlap is the other thing, right? Leatherbacks start early, then we get our loggerheads and our and our greens. Um, so there's not necessarily a time where all the moms are done laying and it's just hatchlings trying to make it. Um, but it's a good point. And like I said, we're going to have to start getting creative with with some of these conservation uh, implications. We've been watering nests with watering cans. I wouldn't put it past us to put uh, a runway for turtles as well. Yeah. I yeah. was reading recently before you came out that they were talking about, you know, can turtles see the sea? And then they were talking about the moon, the full moon, having that. Goal, yeah. That they more, more turtles go out when it's a full moon. Yes, that is, uh, that's my master's work. You just read my, my published article. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so uh, it's not necessarily the full moon itself. So we might think, oh, turtles crawl towards the moon, right? But remember the moon moves. So if the moon is over the land, that's gonna cause a problem. Our turtles are actually going to sample a really wide, but not very high subset of the horizon. So stars, the moon, any, any radiance that's reflecting off the water will be brighter 
than reflecting off the dune. Those wavelengths are more readily absorbed by the dune and they reflect off the water. So that's how they crawl to the water. So even at new moon, they can do it, which is pretty incredible. So thank you guys so much for your time. I appreciate you. Um, maybe if you want to see some, some cool stuff, we've got some hatchlings that didn't make it out of the nest, but you can come see about how they are. These are natural, right? Uh, and we can learn from them. So yeah, just be careful, but yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's it's not it's about living. But there's a really cool study that they find that if they're laid on the back of some line of latitude, they're actually more genetically similar than if they're closer to the same. So they Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, guys. I'm going to end this now. Thanks.